I'm uh, honored to be having an artist conversation with uh, Trish Alexandro. And Trish has been with the Bear Group since I think about like 1999. So she started when she was five years old. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, Trish is is an amazing um, actor and uh, storyteller and teacher and she has been in many productions with the bear group she was in the unrepeatable moment uh where the new york times gave her a glowing glowing review she was in perp by lyle kessler she was in expecting isabel and also did her one woman show where she played all these different uh characters with all these different accents so we'll get to talk about that too but also trish is an amazing teacher and she is teaching uh, a wonderful uh, class at the Barrow Group, which I think, you know, I'm gonna take. And, and you said it was acting. Making it a career. Making it a career, acting, making it a career, which uh, is uh, fantastic. So that's happening at the Barrow Group. But um, so welcome, Trish, welcome. We're so glad that you're uh, here with us. So, you know, the first question I kind of throw out um, to uh, people, hi, Michael, Michael, welcome, welcome, uh, is like, what's keeping you inspired? these days uh trish yeah well i mean the the inauguration was really inspiring to me and the energy around that was really inspiring the um the sense of hope that's been restored uh to a lot of people has been really encouraging um and then i mean i've just i've been reading so many books over this um this quarantine and this covid era and uh, I'm a bit of like a habits nerd and uh, personal development nerd. So it's just been a really rich time for that, for like sort of going inward and um, working on myself and then figuring out how to bring that information to the class I teach at the Barrow Group. Mm -hmm. And then also just be sort of bigger in the world, you know, be a little bit less afraid of being who I am in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, God, my, I have a sister-in-law, Jennifer, who is, um, she's a speech teacher actually, and a visual artist. And she started making these videos during quarantine where she would put a wig on and she was just like in the kid's playroom. And it was almost this like desperation of like, I need an outlet, you know, I'm home with the kids and like homeschooling, I'm, you know, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And she would just make up these characters. And I loved like the freedom of her expression and uh, the silliness of it and all the, you know, just the artistry, the whole thing. So that was really inspiring to me. I think what I've learned also during this quarantine is like, just not to be, try to be so perfect all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think especially in our industry, there can be this very high bar of like, don't age and don't, um, you know, make sure the lighting is always perfect and make sure whatever. And if so, you know, she's not in our industry. So it was just so lovely to be like, oh my God, Jennifer, I love what you're coming up with. And so I reached out to a friend of mine who, um, Daniel, who's a, a drag queen also, his mm -hmm. drag name is Paige Turner. And I asked Daniel, can you recommend wigs for me? Mm -hmm. so I just purchased my first wig today and I can't wait I can't wait to like create a character with this wig. And this is inspired by my sister-in-law. Um, yeah, so there's just a, a sense of maybe a little more freedom, like artistic freedom that's happened because I've been um, just going inward a little bit more and, and asking myself, like, what are the things that bring me joy? Right. And I love playfulness and I love silliness. And I come from a really playful, silly family. And I want to let more of that out. Right, that is so great uh which will kind of uh there's like three things that you kind of said that i want to tap into that um you said you're kind of a, a habits nerd or like a personal development uh nerd and i just kind of have to say like you you your discipline or your artistic discipline and your spiritual discipline and your uh artistic discipline is so fabulous uh and maybe if you could just kind of talk about that uh, a little bit, like your personal discipline or, yeah, like your, your personal discipline. Yeah, I mean, I think that's been a, a journey for me because, um, you know, just being an actor and having a lot of side jobs, I felt like I don't know where to focus my energy or how. And so it was, it, it was this sort of search for a feeling of, um, 
you know, when you have in mind what your sort of purpose is or, or the thing that makes you come alive. And for me, it's writing and acting specifically. Mm -hmm. When you know those things, you're trying to find a way to express that as much as possible, as often as possible. Um, and, uh, and it can feel like life is getting in the way, right? I have bills to pay and, and my side job and, you know, all these things. And, uh, and there, it can lead to a lot of like self-recrimination and self-flagellation. So I was just looking for books and teachers who, um, who gave me ideas on what to do, like how to structure my days and, mm -hmm. and how to put more of my art into the world in a way that felt good. Um, and, and also how to recover, you know, because that's another thing that like, we're not really taught in our culture and we're also not taught as artists. It's like, unless you're creating at all times, you're, you're failing. Um, and, and I think, you know, just as, as nature has its cycles, like we need to create and then go in and, yes. and recover and create and then go in and recover. So, um, so yeah, I mean, what I've been playing with lately is, um, Savers, which is an acronym that's uh, Hal Elrod is the author. He, he wrote The Miracle Morning. That sounds right. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love this book. Um, yeah, so it's called The Miracle Morning. And Hal Elrod basically was also on the same sort of quest as I was of like how to be, how to close the gap between who I can be and who I am being right now. Beautiful. In that gap is where our anxiety and depression lies, right? If we know that we could be here, but we're kind of showing up here on a regular basis, that's where all that feeling of angst comes in and we're just constantly beating ourselves up. So he was studying like, what do the most sort of productive and, and peaceful and um, happy people do with their days? And he found a combination of these things and said, what if I did all six of them every morning? So Savers, stands for silence, affirmations, visualizations, exercise, uh, reading, and scribing, which is writing. Mm -hmm. So I do that combination in the morning. Mm -hmm. And you can do five minutes of each, you know, he's not saying like, you have to spend 12 hours every morning, like, mm -hmm. I do 15 minutes of meditation, but the other things I do pretty much in five to 10 minute increments. And that just kind of sets my day up. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I have a better chance of being like, of achieving equanimity with my emotions for the rest of the day, of yeah. you know, meeting challenges with a little bit more um, of a sense of possibility and mm -hmm. optimism and all that. Um, so that's one thing that's been really key for me. And then the other thing is, um, is having like bookends, they call it. So a, an AM ritual and a PM ritual. Um, so my PM ritual is I write a little bit in my journal before I go to bed. And then while I'm in bed, I ask myself what went right today mm -hmm. so that I'm ending my day on some, a positive note and giving myself credit for what did happen. That was good. And instead of being like, Oh, I didn't get these five things done that were on my to-do list, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. And just even practicing, cause I'm a one that practices that discipline every day too. And I just kind of feel like the day goes better when I do my meditation, the breaths, a little writing, gratitude showers, you know, just even just that stuff. I'm much, the day goes much better when I practice that discipline. And I love your AM and, you know, PM uh, ritual, which is really wonderful. And I love uh, that whole thing about, you know, restoring ourselves as artists. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that whole thing that, you know, we're, we put so much pressure on ourselves to create, create, you got to be out there, you got to make it happen, you know, go, 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 that we don't really take that time to quiet ourselves, to connect with nature, to restore. And um, I think that's, that's, yeah, that's wonderful that uh, you're kind of balancing that out, right? Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. That yeah. was one of the gifts of COVID, I think, too, was like we were all forced to, to slow down. You know, if I look at, I, I have, you know, physical planners, I use paper still. And I looked at my planner from last year and it was like, you know, eight things were scheduled in a day. I was on like the subway six times a day. Um, so just like, I think that was really good for all of us right. <laughs> to be forced to just stay still for a bit and see and let the discomfort come up and let the things that we were maybe ignoring come up right. um, and, and also see what's coming up for other people, you know, 
but uh, what needs to be he healed as a nation, as a group of people, as whatever, and, and how can I contribute to that healing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I loved um, like one of the uh, earlier conversations that we had in, in March when we were doing either the teas with Lee and Seth or uh, I think a teacher, you know, conversation and someone asked you, uh, oh, what have you learned in COVID, you know, during this time? And you said, oh, I'm spending more time with the trees and the squirrels and I'm listening to what they have to say. So oh. I'm, I've, I've stolen that line, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was going to ask you, what else have you learned in COVID uh, during this time? And it sounds like just that slowing down. But are there any other things that you've taken away in this time? Uh, I think, yeah, I think it's a, like a self-compassion is really. Mm -hmm. And I think that that it needs to start there. You know, like with all of the sort of angry conversations that are happening yeah. in the world, like I cannot bring peace to the world until I have peace in here. Mm -hmm. um, I can't extend compassion to somebody else until I know how to extend true compassion to myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, ooh, that makes me teary. Okay. Um, <laughs> we knew it had to happen sometime. Like. <laughs> here they are. Um, yeah, so just that uh that practice and again it is a complete practice that and right yeah you know oddly enough like self tapes have really um brought that lesson home to me because um i'm you know i have a fear of technology and all of a sudden it was like well you better get really acquainted with technology really quickly because now you have to buy a ring light and a backdrop and a, learn how to edit and you know uh submit these things and you know i was, i and you know the one grace about theater is that I become less self-conscious. You know, when I'm on stage, I lose myself in the in when right. in the best circumstances, right. and uh, and just I'm aware of the communion with the audience. Right. With self tapes, I'm just all of a sudden really aware of like, oh my God, there's a shine on my forehead, there's wrinkles over here, there's blah blah blah. You know, all the stuff that I just I don't even want to go there. So it's been this practice of like. Okay. Acknowledge that voice, right? I have a teacher that says we have an inner dictator and an inner wild child. And then we have the watcher and the watcher is the neutral. So how often can we like return ourselves to the watcher? That's like, okay, mm -hmm. all right. You know, just yeah. letting the dictator have its say of like, how could you do such a terrible job on this. You look like you just started acting, you know? And then the wild child that's like, forget it. You don't have to memorize your lines. Just whatever, submit it, just do it, you know? And where's the balance, you know? Right. I kind of use the same things, but I kind of say Judy Judge, like Judy Judge is sitting on her shoulder and the observer observing that. But I think I'm gonna add that little wild child, right? With the wild child is your, your, uh, you know, your wanna just go play and go do stuff. And yeah, yeah, so it's really just balancing all of that or listening to all three of those, yeah. those voices. But um, yeah, the watcher, the observer, yeah, just getting that back to neutral, just kind of balancing all that out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really great. So self-compassion, huge, huge practice, huge yeah. practice on all of it with these Zoom classes, with the self-tapes, with, uh, um, you know, uh, helping people to stay creative during this, uh, this time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also the, like, it helped me learn what like real connection is, right? Because it's very easy to like go on social media for a quick hit of some sort of peripheral connection. And and sometimes it really does feel like connection. It's, it's a really nice, it can be a really nice connection on social media. Um, but what it's made me do is be more deliberate about who are the people in my life that feel like uplifters to me. Um, and how can I reach out to them more often that there's been a lot of vulnerability there for me, um, surprisingly, where I'm like, oh, it feels like asking somebody out on a date or something to, you know, to call a friend. That's interesting. You know, um, I also I come from a large family. Mm -hmm. And so they're always my go to, you know, it's very easy to call my mom mm -hmm. or, you know, talk to one of my siblings. But to nurture friendships uh, takes a little bit more vulnerability and effort. So um, I've been trying to show up a little bit more for my friendships. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a little more vulnerably and consistently. 
Uh huh. Great. And just I love what you said just about you know real connection as opposed to your social media um, hit. Uh, and looking yeah. at that, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Your your relationship with you know what what are our relationships with people or with ourselves uh, with the social media you know, with uh, the doorman and the, you know, the grocery store people, what are, what are those connections that we have yes. in our lives, right? Um, mm -hmm. Good, so good. Um, also, I just wanted to tap in a little bit just with you. You are so um, um, fabulous with your accents and uh, creating all these fantastic uh, characters. Um, for those of you that has haven't seen, you know, Trish perform, she, can go from you know character to character to character to character just within a snap or as i say you know dancing on a dime um and i think you have like over 20 25 different accents like in your your repertoire of yeah, yeah that, might be, <laughs> that might be generous <laughs> um but uh just um maybe you could share a little bit on your process number one like what kind of characters inspire you uh, like with your snapshot show that you did. Well, maybe this is a twofold question. Um, and then how you work on the accents. Yeah, um, so the characters that inspire me are very often based on women that I grew up around who I felt like were not being showcased so much on the stage. I didn't see characters like this so much when I read plays or when I saw plays or watched TV or watch movies. And so I started to write um, what I wasn't seeing and um, and to tell these sort of what I thought were like unsung hero stories, you know, um, the Caribbean nurse that I worked with or, um, you know, the girls that I went to school with who, um, you know, were all sorts of different ethnicities because I, I grew up in Queens and it was like wherever there was sort of social or political unrest, you'd have this influx of people from that country, mm -hmm. um, whether it was Pakistan or India or Haiti or Jamaica or, you know, there was just um, every kind of um, accent and culture around me. And I, uh, it was such a rich yeah. place to grow up, you know, um, and it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized, or maybe till high school that I was like, oh, not everybody grew up around that you know, around this, this different accents, around uh, different clothing, around um, different food, and uh, just the melody of mm -hmm. um, different languages and all that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, it's hard to extricate like who I am from the experiences that I've had growing up. So mm -hmm. those were the stories that I felt most sort of on fire to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my mother is, first of all, a great mimic, like she's a teacher um, and she's a great storyteller and she always used people's accents when she would tell the story, she would tell the, the story as them and it was just mesmerizing, it still is. Um, so I think that perhaps I inherited her ear a little bit um, and but also like hearing her try accents out, I was like, okay, let me try them out, you know? Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that about your mom. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's really interesting because you're, you do have a fantastic ear, but so fun. Uh, I didn't know that. So she would mimic uh, these kind of characters or act these characters out and you would see that. Yeah. And she would get it absolutely spot on. We had a woman who lived next door who was from India and my mom could just do her mannerisms and her voice perfectly. And it was, always like a, a tribute to them, never like a, you know, a sort of making fun of or anything. It was, it was this beautiful, like, oh my God, she captured them. She got it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think there was that desire to, to be like my mom. And, um, and it wasn't until like, you know, I got cast at the Humana Festival and I was playing 14 characters. All of us were playing multiple characters. And they kept switching the characters. They would, you know, because it was, the play was being written like while we were rehearsing, basically, um, changes were being made. So it was written by Susan Soonhee Stanton, who uh, writes for Succession right now, the TV show. And so she'd come in and she'd be like, okay, today, you know, this is your character. And it would be a Russian accent. And then the next day she'd come in and she'd be like, uh, okay, I'm gonna give that character to this actor because they're gonna be, um, you know, 
entering from that side of the stage and you're going to be on that side of the stage. So it was like all the logistics of who was entering and exiting and who was going to play which character. So then it was like, okay, you're playing the Moroccan character and now you're playing this character. So I was terrified, you know, because these were some <laughs> accents that I had never tried. And, um, you know, you're surrounded by these actors who were, who went to Juilliard and who went to Columbia and whatever. So I already had this sense of like, oh my God, I hope I'm not the weak link. Um, and they were like, you know, we're going to have um, like a dialect coach come in, but he can't come until like two weeks in. So you just have to, part of it is you have to be willing to sound bad in the beginning. I mean, the other actors laughed at me hard when I, I didn't grow up around a French accent, like, mm -hmm. uh, and so when I tried to do French, it came out like Turkish or something. So, you know, she was like, you're gonna play this French character. And I started to read the lines and I just started laughing and everybody else did too. And I'm like, I'll get it, I swear I'll get it. Um, but I just had to work on it. You know, you figure yeah. out like what part of the mouth the sounds are coming out of, and, you know, how your tongue is moving and all those things. And the dialect coach was very helpful, but I watched a, a million YouTube videos and then, you know, um, interviews with French people and all this stuff. Um, <laughs> Oh my God. But it was, it was very vulnerable. And even the audition, I had to do a Welsh accent and I was like, right. Love of God, <laughs> you know? Wow. Wow. So fabulous that even that story, it's about, she kind of changed uh, your characters from just the entrances where you were entering. It's like, okay, you're Russian. No, you're Moroccan. That that's crazy. Right. Yeah. So you can kind of think about that. That's like kind of crazy thinking. And I love the comment that you said that you just have to really be okay with sounding bad, um, you know, wherever you are, uh, because I think everybody goes, uh, you know, through that. You like with those accents, you're working on that accent, you go, oh, that doesn't quite sound right, or that doesn't, you know, uh, sound right. And can I ask you a question? Because I think your ear is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you're really good with accents? Um, I think I eventually am. Eventually. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, my, my boyfriend speaks German. Uh -huh. And, you know, woo, he tells me a few words every day to try. And I'm like, wow, you know, my mouth does not want to move that way. Right. So, yeah. So I, I have the sense that I, I have a growth mindset, they would call it in the personal development world. Right. So a fixed mindset is like, I'm either good at this or I'm bad at this. A growth mindset is like, I can be good at this. Right. I just have to work at it. Right. So that's, right mindset that I have around accents is like, if you give me an, enough time, I will get this down. <laughs> I will get it. <laughs> um, you know, maybe a native speaker will be like, no, nope, but I'll get it close enough, you know? Yeah. And I love that. I love that taking out the good, bad and just go the growth mind uh, set tour, even if you're trying a little bit and you're getting that sound a little bit, uh, it's just, you're learning about it uh, every day. So yeah, I think yeah. it's, you know, again, it's a, that comes down to perfectionism for me. Like we're not here to be perfect. We're here to, to express ourselves. And especially in art, it's like, right. you know, we're, we're here to tell a story to the best of our ability and get as close as possible. Right. Um, but you know, if I, you know, say a couple of words sounding like I'm Turkish instead of French, like, <laughs> please just excuse me. <laughs> tapped on this a little bit but uh your beautiful relationship with perfectionism like mm. you you've tapped on this some tools that help that um a little bit but maybe you could talk about uh help you how you help yourself with letting go of that perfectionism the practice of that it is just process um being gentle with yourself where you are but are there some other things that you practice about letting go of the perfectionism so that doesn't halt you in your creative process? Um, I think, well, first of all, doing things early in the day, I find that my perfectionistic mind hasn't um, sort of woken up yet. So if I write earlier in the day, um, I tend to be a little bit gentler on myself. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, I'm, I'm just become really okay with that really violent voice in my head and you know it's it can be really convincing it's just yeah. like it's really shaming yeah. and it wants to keep me small and and yeah. so just getting really familiar with that voice and being like oh there it is again mm -hmm. and it's gonna feel like I I'm used to the sensations now like you know my face gets hot 
I feel a sort of storm inside of my chest. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is from, you know, life coach training too. They really mm -hmm. teach you to check into your body. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? How does enlightenment feel in your body? How does freedom feel in your body? And now how does shame feel in your body? And how did these things, so that you start to associate the physical sensations with it. And then you can maybe step into your observer a little bit easier. Like, oh, that's, that's the shame feeling that I'm having. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, although it feels true right now, I know that it's not true. Mm -hmm. So how can I, and breath is a huge part of that, right? Breath automatically takes us into our parasympathetic system mm -hmm. from our sympathetic. So our sympathetic is the fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. The parasympathetic system is our pause and plan. Mm -hmm. So just making our exhale a little bit longer than our inhale, doing that a few times, automatically flips the switch. Mm -hmm. So knowing a couple of those tricks, it can be helpful. I am right. just keeping my breathing for a little bit, see if you know, and yeah. even like a barrel group tool of like just touching something in my environment, which brings right. me back to the present moment. I'm here. Right. Okay. Right. You know? right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's wonderful. And I love that, that you kind of talk about even the times of day that, Ooh, in the morning, it's a little, um, uh, less than it is at night, like late at night. Sometimes it's like, okay, just, um, store is closed. Uh, let's just, you know, reflect and take a bath and just kind of rest a little bit. Um, <laughs> And also, I love that you said just even getting comfortable with that voice. So sometimes, like I know I talk about light, Judy Judge, we can't get rid of that Judy Judge. So that, that voice is there. And especially for artists, um, you know, maybe that is your inner critic that's going to help you be a better artist. So how are you able to kind of listen to it, but it's not, you know, make sure that it goes to take a hot bath or something. So it's not too loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not too loud uh and that it paralyzes um you but yes i think breathing is so key uh and also just recognizing when that uh when that comes up and you know just keep yeah, also trusting you know if there are people around you who you trust and you feel like you're off in judy judge land i'll ask my boyfriend like am i blowing this out of proportion you and Seth have been great with that too. If I'm like, oh my God, that sucked. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, <Thank> you. <laughs> um, to just be like, oh, okay. It's helpful sometimes to just take in another perspective because I'm so in my own you judge. Yeah. 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 Which I think a lot, you know, a lot of actors, uh, so many actors are right. Um, yeah. So what are you, uh, so what are you working on now? So you're working on, yeah. What do you, what are you up to? now that <laughs> creatively what you're doing um okay so a few things well one i'm going to be on a, a tv show bowl on monday yay, yay. <laughs> from the director that i'm it's okay to say it now okay. um so that was fun i got to work with the same director who i worked with on law and order and he's just such a love such a good guy um and then uh, I started a 300 day coaching program. So I already did, you know, a nine month coaching program last year, but this is another one that's um, at this guy, Brian Johnson, I've been following for years. I love it. So um, that's going to be like the next 300 days. <laughs> and it's, you know, just really so dialing in 300 days or 100 days, 300 days. 300 days. And it, you know, I'm using it to coach myself and then also to use on my clients. Yeah. Um, whether I'm career coaching them or life coaching them, right? But it's, you know, it's self mastery and working on our daily discipline and all those things. Um, and just use, like learning tools for those, which I just, I absolutely love because I love watching my students and my clients faces like light up mm -hmm. when it feels like something is decipherable or attainable that before just felt like I'll never get this. I'll just right. never, ever write on a regular basis. I'll never have a habit of this. I'll never, you know, and once something becomes uh, all of a sudden like doable or within reach, there's just this release that happens um, mm -hmm. for me too. So mm -hmm. I love learning those things and I love sharing that information. Mm -hmm. so I'm excited. Um, I'm teaching a class at Barra Group on February 6th and 7th, uh, acting, making it a career. Mm -hmm. I love teaching that class. Mm -hmm. I feel like you know, in communion, we learn so much more. I learn something every time I teach the class, the class evolves every time I teach it. Um, so it's just, it's lovely to, for, I think for everybody to feel a sense of community of I'm not alone. I'm not the only one going through this. 
And then also just the group problem solving of like, maybe this is something you could do if that's what you're trying to accomplish. Maybe this, yeah. you know? Yeah. I uh, loved uh, what you threw out um, when you are giving yourself, uh, you know, a goal. Um, sometimes, um, you know, like we'll make our New Year's resolutions and you give yourself that goal. It's like, okay, I'm, you know, exercise an hour a day. I'm in an hour a day. And so that month of uh, January, you're really good exercising an hour a day. And then February comes and goes, I don't know, it's a little cold out. I'm not going to. I don't want to do this anymore. So, so I loved what you were saying about even just the the goal that you might set for yourself instead of like an hour of day, then just make your discipline for uh, like five minutes a day. So the ability, you take the ability down so that the goal is achievable or, yeah. and then you kind of feel like, oh yeah, I exercised for five minutes. I did it. It's yeah. good. And so that's a little bit easier to, to do. Yeah. Um, or like, oh, I'm going to spend an hour writing, you know, on my book. I'm going to write, I'm going to write a book. It's like, no, I'm going to write a sentence every day, just one sentence. So the ability is lower and then it's achievable to do. And then you go, oh, I think that's ridiculous. Just writing one sentence. And then you go, oh, I've just written a whole page or I've written for a half an hour, but you take that ability down and then all of a sudden you're doing it a little bit more and you're taking that pressure off of yourself. And I found that so helpful, oh. that tool. So yeah. helpful been huge in my own life and that's um there's a great book called tiny habits by bj fogg and he's considered the sort of godfather of habits and behavior change right. um he's a lovely guy uh, just from his book i've never met him <laughs> a lovely way about him tiny um, habits, right <laughs> yeah yeah so he talks about um abc is the way to start a new habit so a is anchor b is behavior and c mm -hmm. is celebration Mm -hmm. So you want to anchor it to something that you already do. So if I already have a habit of brushing my teeth first thing in the morning, then I will anchor it to that, right? Because that'll be my cue, right? Right after I brush my teeth, I do five push-ups. Mm -hmm. um, so the behavior is the five push-ups. And then C is the celebrations. What they've found neuroscience-wise is that if we celebrate the behavior, it wires faster into our brains. Our right. body likes the celebration. So right have the celebration come as quickly as possible right after the behavior uh -huh. so I brush my teeth I write two pages I celebrate by shaking my booty or waving my arms in the air I mean if you follow me around during the day you just see me going like this all the time <laughs> victory you know I just celebrate constantly the whole day just to wire these habits in and yeah. then it just it keeps you coming back for more it yeah. reminds you to do the habit again and then you can build on it incrementally. Like I've had clients be like, great, so I'm gonna be doing five push-ups for the rest of my life. I'm like, no, uh, like once that's established, then like you can, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> but we wanna do everything in such big increments. And right. Jay Fogg was saying, it's not that we're making the wrong goals, it's just that we're making them too big. big. Yeah, yeah. So we wanna make it achievable. Right. <laughs> and right. How it, that's how we'll show up for it is if right. it's you know five minutes of, of reading instead of I've got to read a whole book every whatever just yeah yeah minutes or whatever feels accessible to you yeah I think that's so fabulous for actors you know just for well for anybody but for actors in this business about where do I start mm -hmm. how do I even I got to do it all I got to get this agent I got to go yeah. to all these calls I got to do all these self tapes I got to create my own stuff um yeah, so just even starting, um, yeah, just yeah. kind of starting small like that. Um, so much of the work I do with actors is just having them, like, what's the goal? Put it in the middle of your page. And then what are all of the behaviors that you can think of? Just, it's called a swarm of bees all for behavior. Just what are all of the behaviors that you could think of and go as tiny as possible from like, I've got a Google headshot photographers um, and just, break it down like that and then spend a little time each day doing those things and you'll be shocked at how good you'll feel because momentum builds and it feels great right you know, start to feel that success and that sense of like i do things when i say that i'm going to do them i actually show up and i do them and that it builds on itself so that you get more and more excited to to take your actions every day yeah yeah, so good, so good. Um, I did want to open this up to the um, 
you know, for questions, if people have questions, and we could just go to the chat and you can chat these in, or Quinn, who's helping us on Facebook Live, she will um, give some questions. So if anybody here has some questions that they wanna um, throw out to uh, Trisha, you can type them in and I will, um, you know, I will ask her uh, these questions. Oh, here comes one. Um, the, uh, what, um, what did you, what experience was your best experience at the Barrow Group? At the Barrow Group. Oh, that's really hard to pick. Oh, I mean, I loved being directed by you in Perp and working with um, Paul Ben Victor. So funny. He's oh. so funny, right? <laughs> so fun. Such a, oh my God, such a character. I, I think um, the relationships that are formed backstage, I mean, it's, it's like hard to choose even like where I'm having more fun, you know? I loved doing Unrepeatable Moment, John Yearly's piece. It was a monologue um, that was a, a night of, you know, all of his pieces, like 1X. I absolutely loved playing that character because she was just coming apart at the seams. And I, I always try to come across as so put together. So when I get to play a character that's just like, she has no, you know, uh, gauge of how she's coming across to other people, it's like, heaven for me. Um, and I was directed by my good friend, Shannon Patterson Giese, um, which was, you know, heaven. And, um, but then, you know, backstage, you're just like hooting and hollering. It's, these are people I've known now for 20 years. So uh, it's just such a family at the Barrow Group and, and such a humble, playful, talented group of folks that um, like, I, I haven't had a bad experience of doing a play there. I, mm. Every time I get cast, I'm just like, wee! <laughs> Yay! Oh, yeah. So um, thank you, thank you. Um, well, I have, I have lots of questions uh, coming in here, so I will uh, start working through them. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the class? Sure. So the class is a two-day class, and the first day I kind of focus on how to create new habits and how to stop doing habits that might be, we call them your kryptonite, um, the, the habits that are leaking your energy or taking more of your time than you'd like them to. Um, and then just sort of like taking a really honest look at how you're spending your time, what, um, what your vision is for your life in the next 12 months, mm -hmm. um, just getting really clear on that, strategizing actions that you can take each month for the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking at the limiting beliefs or painful beliefs that might be holding you back. Cause a lot of us know maybe what we should be doing and aren't, and we're just not doing those things. And sometimes it's because those limiting beliefs are running the show. Like I'm too old. I should have started 10 years ago. I'm not pretty enough. I have too much weight on me. You know, I've heard the gamut. So a lot of times if you're carrying those beliefs around, you're not going to be taking inspired action every day in service of your career. Cause you don't actually believe anything's going to happen, you know? So we take also take a look at those and, and some tools for dismantling them. Yes. <laughs> Please. Yes. We need you. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> dismantling those beliefs, right? Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Um, great. I know it's, it's, I've taken this class and it's, it's so fabulous. It's really, it's so, it's, I need to take it again. Um, it's so good. Um, uh, second question, uh, who are some of your acting inspirations? I love uh, Frances McDormand. I love um, Robin Wright's work. I love uh, Tony Collette. Mm -hmm. um, I love, I love sort of just, I guess, badass women like Olivia Coleman. Also, I think women who maybe made it a little bit later <laughs> in the game because uh, that's been my experience of like, I'm starting to feel like I'm just coming into my own now. Um, and, and it's a really powerful feeling. And it's also like, you know, the, you kind of want to pass it on like, oh, wow, it's, it's actually like much more interesting in your thirties and beyond, even though, <laughs> you know, the ingenue roles or whatever are what we're told to covet, like life gets so much more interesting as you age. Um, mm -hmm. And you have so many more stories to tell and so much more to share and so much more wisdom. And so I love, um, yeah, I just love the, the actors who embody that for me, um, who play like a rich tapestry of women. Um, 
and who are really, I think, honest when they're interviewed. I really appreciate that. Right, right. You tell it like it is. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I do. I totally do too. That's uh, good. Um, those are such inspirational people. Fantastic. Um, another question. How can an artist create content for online platforms consciously without becoming a part of the herd? That's a great question. Um, great question. It's a, Monica, such a good question. Oh, Monica. Really good question. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, do, I get my content through journaling very often. Um, so I identify a few things that are important to me, like family is important to me. Um, social justice is important to me. Um, feminism is important to me. And, and it doesn't always have to come out in a like, raw kind of a way it can come across as a playful also and joking, right. whatever else. But um, I kind of zero down into like, what are the things that are important to me? Because I, those are the things I want to talk about. Um, how can I make this playful? Because people often hear things. And I think that's, you know, that's a great thing about being an artist also is people will hear things, especially I think in a theater or movie theater that they wouldn't be able to hear in conversation. Right. So how can I, I have a brother who's a comedian who's great at this, you know, he's great at taking social justice issues and making them funny in a way that like, you're like, that's true. And I'm also laughing, you know? Um, so I like to keep some levity in there, but yeah, I like start asking yourself like, what's important to me? Mm -hmm. What do I want to talk about? Mm -hmm. And now how can I do it in a way that's inviting mm -hmm. instead of lecturing or, and I don't, you know, I don't always hit this balance well, especially as I like take all these coaching programs. I'm like, you know, do this, don't do that. <laughs> you know, so I have to temper that a bit, but, um, but yeah, it's like, what are the things that make me come alive? What are the things I do where I lose time? Um, where I'm, you know, it all of a sudden I turn around and it's five o'clock, you know, those are the things that, um, and what are the, what are my strengths? Um, because, you know, we may think it's like, whatever, but other people don't have that strength. So they're excited to see it, you know, right. Right. I do an accent. To me, it's like, whatever, I've been doing this accent for 20 years, but right. somebody else is like, whoa, you know, <laughs> I, never, I didn't know you could do that accent or it's amazing or whatever, you know. So then, uh, yeah, recognizing what your strengths are and also, um, and being a little playful and lighthearted with it, I think, or right. would be my advice. That's beautiful, that's good. Um, thank you, that, that's amazing. Um, the next question, okay, you uh, you mentioned looking for ways to structure your days being a part of this industry. So my question is, apart from the six things that you mentioned uh, that you do in the morning, what are some things that you'd recommend aspiring actors to include uh, in their day-to-day? -day? Right, um, well, I mean, it depends on what your focus is, first of all. Like some people are like, I really want theater, I want improv, I want, you know, this, that. So. Um, my first thing would be to get specific on what makes you come alive. What kind of characters do you want to play? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of shows do you enjoy seeing? And um, I think sometimes we go about it backwards as actors. It's just like, who will employ me? Right. Who wants me? Um, instead of asking ourselves, what do I love? Right. You know, wh whether or not anybody else sees me doing that thing, what, what do I really enjoy doing? So for me, I was like, I really love playing a lot of different characters. So I, and I also love writing. So where can I find theater companies that have the equivalent of like an open mic, you know? So there's Tuesdays at nine, Naked Angels, there's the Shelter Theater Company, there's uh, First Fridays. So start looking for those kinds of things where I can submit my work um, and see if I can get an invitation to perform my work. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but you know, if, if, if you're not a writer and you just wanna be cast in something, what are the shows that are currently casting in New York City? Um, how can I get to know those casting directors? Um, I talk about in my class, the, the seven touches that they use in advertising and take seven times of somebody seeing something before they remember it, mm -hmm. which is why advertisers like Bed Bath & Beyond will just keep sending you that Bed Bath & Beyond coupon, right? You start to think like, I need a curtain rod. Oh, Bed Bath & Beyond, you know? Um, so to have yourself front of mind in these casting directors or directors or writers' heads, um, 
how can you get in front of them more often or how can you cultivate a relationship with them, an authentic, vulnerable relationship with them um, by having seven touches. And that could be through taking a class with them or um, you know, online relationship through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage people to make a really short list. Again, tiny habits uh, methodology there. So uh, five people that whose work you love, mm -hmm. who you'd like to know them. Maybe it's a playwright, um, a casting director, a director, a cinematographer. What five people that you're just like, I love the work that they do and they could be part of my tribe. You know, I think we like to tell the same kind of stories and, um, and then just start to, to target that. The other thing I suggest is doing um, 90 minutes of what's called deep work right after your morning ritual. So right after I finish savers, I put my phone on airplane mode, put it in the closet so I can't even look at it, and then do set a timer for 90 minutes. And I get done the hardest thing or the thing that I'm most dreading. So one day it could be emails because I really don't like writing emails. Um, well, today it was ordering a wig, <laughs> um, just because that was most important to me today. I want to order a wig. You know, I want this day. I, by the end of the day, I want to have ordered a wig. Um, so just setting up, and then that makes you also clarify for yourself what is most important to me right now, mm -hmm. instead of your day sort of frittering away and getting out of you know your grasp, and then all of a sudden it's like five o'clock, and you're like, what did I do today? And mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I love, uh, as you said, the timer. I'm a big timer person too. Mm -hmm. Just even those things that you're dreading, if you just kind of, oh, I'm gonna do this for, put the timer on for 20 minutes, you said 90, but I go, oh, 20 uh, or just 10. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just vacuum for 10 minutes. And yeah. so I'm just gonna clean up for 10 minutes. And when the timer goes off, it's done. And right. maybe I'll set it for another 10 minutes. But uh, so the timer is on top of it rather than, I got to do that or I can extra I'm going to meditate I meditate actually with the timer so I put it for 20 minutes and then when the timer goes off uh, yeah. so I'm not kind of checking to say oh my 15 minutes is it 20 oh come back to the breath oh you you know you're failing at this meditation again I guess so it's like so the timer does it so I love that that thing about the timer and I love so much that you're saying just to get again sh starting smaller and uh cultivating those people that you you know you like their work and uh so and i love you know seven times like sometimes you know people go oh i sent my photo and resume to them and i didn't get anything back it's uh, or i called them to follow up and i didn't get anything back but seven's my favorite number and i think seven you just gotta ah. keep doing it keep doing it keep yeah. doing it yeah Terrific. Um, let me. I think we have another uh, question here. So so good. That is uh, so good. You know. Um, uh, yeah. Anne Bogart talks about her micro habits. I think yeah. is another thing too. The micro habit. She says it takes uh, like half the day for her to get into the day because she has so many micro habits now <laughs> that it's uh, her day doesn't really start until like two o'clock because of all of the journal writing, meditation, little exercise, all that stuff. Um, Good. So, oh, what do you like most and least about working on a TV show? Uh, I like most, I mean, it's still new for me. So there's this like first day of school feeling um, in a good way. Like I get really excited just to, um, to get on set, to have my hair and makeup done. I think that's so much fun um, to, you know, have somebody have picked out wardrobe for me. I think that's so fun. Um, and then I love... I love collaborating and I don't know if it's part of being, you know, a one of seven, you know, I have a big family, uh, but I, I just love that energy, you know, and I love a, a playfulness. Um, I also have three older brothers and it's often like a lot of men on, on <laughs> sets. And I just, ha I feel like they're my brothers very quickly. I'm just like joking around with them. And, um, and it just feels like, oh my God, I can't believe I get to do this for pay, like this is a job, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I get to be another person, somebody did my hair and makeup and you know, somebody's taking care of the technology part of things for me, this is, this is the best. Um, so yeah, all of that is, is my favorite part of it. My least favorite part is 
probably the you know the choppiness of it the like cut okay reset whatever and it's like oh you know I just was getting into the story <laughs> you know <laughs> so there's uh yeah there's that part can be a little tough and I feel like I'm getting a little more used to a camera being right there um, right. so I'm a little less self-conscious with that but yeah I mean it's not um you're not telling the story beginning to end so that part is a little like Oh, like I just know the magic of telling a story sequentially and without stop. And that's, uh, that part is missing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so good. And I think also for that law and order audition, didn't you just like come in with your hair and the makeup and the earrings and they loved it so much. They wanted exactly what you wore, uh, on set. They just went, we want that exactly. Right. <laughs> that, was, that really felt like magic in that, like, I. Uh, when I got the script, I was like, okay, I know this character. And uh, I just kind of recreated the look of that headshot because I have like four different headshots, uh, that headshot that my um, agents had submitted. And um, I did the audition and I did the callback in that same outfit. And then when I came to set, well, when I went to wardrobe, she was like, uh, can you bring in your earrings that you wore to the audition because they really loved your earrings. And then when I got there the day of filming, the uh, hair lady, I was like so excited to get my hair done. And she was like, can you do your own hair? Because they really loved the way you did your hair for the audition. I was like, man. Um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a feeling of like everything sort of coming together, you know? Mm -hmm. That's good, that's great. Um, another question, uh, what are some things, classes at the Bear Group that you'd recommend aspiring actors to include in their day-to-day -day for TV work, especially comedy? Um, you know, I haven't taken all of the classes at the Barrow Group, so, uh, you know, take this all with a grain of salt. I have, uh, when I went through teacher training, I had um, improv, improv with Mark Grenier, oh, so fun. which I loved. Um, and I think that's a great background for any actor to have. Yeah. Um, I heard such good things about Laurel Manning's um, film and TV class, which I'm going to take. So mm -hmm. I would recommend that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Doug Goldring, is that yep. how you say his name? Yep, yep, yep. He has such a love of a guy, and he teaches a self-tape class, which I think is really important to have those skills and to mm -hmm. practice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I would suggest that class for camera. Those are the ones that are coming to mind at yeah. the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always just, uh, I don't think you can go wrong taking a class at the bear group truthfully i'm like i'm not being paid to say this i, I really <laughs> i paid her to say that right <laughs> so funny um you know what we are just about you know out of time these are so great and i think i got through all the questions look at me okay. oh my goodness and um so uh maybe just one more i'm going to ask uh just finishing i said what inspires you and, and what like what uh gives you hope these days miss trish um, I love that there is just, it just seems to be a more authentic and open conversation about what, um, which people have felt left out and hurt. Um, I think that what my hope is, is that we get better and better at having that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading a book on assertiveness now and uh, and, he, and the author talks about the difference between passive way of speaking, aggressive way of speaking, passive aggressive way of speaking and assertive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I'm very often passive. <laughs> um, and what I see a lot of online and in discourse is aggressive, mm -hmm. but true assertive communication is vulnerable, right? It's, it's, it's owning what your true thoughts and feelings are, mm -hmm. saying it with respect and kindness, mm -hmm. allowing that it's your point of view and it doesn't have to be the other person's point of view. Yeah. Um, and, and then coming back to what do I actually want, right? I want peace in my life. So I, I'm not gonna name call. I want us to have a true discourse. So I'm not gonna insult you. Mm -hmm. um, I want, uh, you know, I want a true and beautiful exchange and world, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, that's, that's where I'm feeling a lot of hope right now mm -hmm. is a sense of like, I think we're all getting clearer on uh, what's been swept under the rug before. So now it's coming to light. And then the next step is how do we create the world that we want to see? Mm 
And how do we do it with kindness, respect, open communication, assertiveness, and love? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really excited to be a part of that conversation through my art and through discourse. And it's not an easy conversation by any means, um, but it's worthwhile. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful and so beautiful to uh, end on that. Uh, fantastic. And maybe if I could just, uh, yeah, uh, um, have everyone turn on their cameras for one moment and we can just say uh, hello and a quick goodbye. So for those of us joining, if you just want to come uh, turn, everyone turn their cameras on and uh, we'll just, uh, you know, give a little love to uh, Trish here and thank her so much for uh, joining us and um, uh, you guys stay healthy, uh, stay happy, and we'll just practice everything that just Trish just said in this last hour. <laughs> okay, take care. Thank you so much for being a part of this, and um, and we'll see you next time. Okay, bye.